Greetings, this is Brooke Ruby, the Nostalgia Catholic, with another Isaac Asimov short story. This one is titled, Death of a Honey Blonde. Um, at least that's the title it had in the one and only story ever published in Saint Detective Magazine in the June 1956 issue. Now, this is a June 1956 issue, but it does not have the Isaac Asimov story in it. In fact, I couldn't find it because apparently it's very hard to come by any of these. This is the British edition. If you look at the price here, it's actually one pound six or a shilling and a half to buy this thing in 1956. I mean, yeah, you have to be that. Shilling and a half, shilling and a sixpence. Since 1956, it's the best shilling and all that. And uh, apparently, between the two different versions of the magazine, you know, the American, the English, and maybe there's other editions like French and German and Dutch and uh, I don't know what else. Apparently, it exists in several different languages. And the thing is, they also don't try to synchronize the story from one country's issue to another. What that translates into, I don't think Death of a Honey Blonde seems to show up in any of the British editions of the magazine at all, as far as I can tell. And I found more of the British ones than the American ones, such as, even such as it is. Now, if I have the January, uh, the June 1956 issue of this from the American, the color scheme would be different. It would be like gray, I think the ink here would be red. And one of these titles would say Death of a Honey Blonde. I think towards the bottom, maybe the next to the bottom would be saying that. This obviously not being the American edition, doesn't have that. The only artwork, however, these have are these little drawings like you see here, these little stick figure drawings. They kind of show up in various places where there's a little additional space. And they don't seem to have any clear relation to the story at hand. They just kind of show up as little fillers for no clear reason. Um, whatever. So, other than that, this magazine has no illustrations. Um, let's see if I have a blurb. It would, of course, have blurbs. So, another stick figure illustration. And sometimes the one on the cover can vary a little from the cover to the neck. So I don't, I can't, I don't have the original. I can't talk about what the original is like, or if there's any textual differences. There's one textual difference I know for a fact, however, and that's that while the same detective magazine titles the story "Death of a Honey Blonde," and that story got gathered up into Asimov's Mysteries. It gets given back its original title that he intended anyway. It's called What's in a Name. And uh, this one really has no, I would say there's no science because there's definitely some chemistry involved, but again, purely factual science. Uh, sort of like that of his, um, you know, A Whiff of Death or The Death Dealers, depending on which edition you're looking at, which it's about science, and it's fiction, so you could call that science fiction, but it lacks all of the science fiction tropes where you kind of go beyond what science really allows for. So you don't have time travel or hyperspace or faster than light travel or alien being or, uh, you know, giant spiders or anything else. I mean, all those usual tropes or even exotic, you know, dystopian civilizations. Utopian, even for that matter. You just have normal science as done in a normal world and in a normal university, and where this all whole thing takes place in a library. So it's really a, a straight detective story, pure and simple. No fantasy aspect, no science fiction in the sense of when you think of it. Sense. So this is really a pure straight mystery, probably one of his first that truly qualify as that. Because, I mean, like, Caves was still, you still got the science fiction. You got, you know, men on other planets from Sirius. There's still men, they're descendants of us, you know, they colonized it how long ago. Rockets, hyperspace travel. And also, you have robots. That's another science fiction thing. Robots that can be 
very humanoid and and respond, you know, interestingly like humans in a lot of ways, and then also unlike humans in a lot of ways. So I mean, again, that's that is a true blend of science fiction and mystery. Here, however, this is straight mystery. Um, maybe even almost more than the other one because there's not that much scientific about it. There's a, a little bit of potassium cyanide has been placed in the uh, tea drunk by one of these girls that was a librarian. Now, there's a scenario here. You've got this university library and they teach chemistry at the university. And they had some the, the chem students. But right now, we're kind of in the break between one school session and another. So there's not much going on at the library. And there's these two girls, and they're, they look almost like twins, even though they're not related to each other at all. They have the same height, same hair. Um, same blue eyes, same wave to their hair, you know, same general figure, tend to dress the same even, you know, and it's just if you look at their faces, they are, you know, they really are, in fact, obviously rather different from each other, but you'd have to kind of get to know them to particularly know this, and so you, you see the blonde girl, she's a honey blonde, and one of them is two of their twins, and they're, like, they're not real twins, like they're genetic, they're just twins in that they look alike. Um, and it basically comes down to who put the potassium, who put the potassium cyanide in the tea. One of them did, and one that did, and, and one of them got poisoned. Either the one put it in her own in the tea and got and drank from the wrong cup by mistake. Oops. Or maybe the other one poisoned the first, which is a far more likely scenario, but how do you prove it, and this is kind of how you prove it. What is kind of neat and different, though, is that you're kind of getting it from the inside. You're the detective trying to figure out how do we do this? How do you nail this down? You're convinced that the surviving girl is the perpetrator, and there might be little ways that she's acting, you know, she kind of has a little, hmm, you know, when something that could have been a clue turns out not to be a clue at all or to deflect your suspicion away from her in some small circumstantial way. You yeah. know. Not that she's free, but that she's getting away with it kind of characteristically. But you know, you can't convict on that kind of stuff. You know she did it. But how do you prove it? There's a lot of uh, mention, however, there is one other chemistry aspect in all of this. There is a German reference work, some 60 volumes plus any number of supplementary volumes, and uh, where they actually list all the different known organic chemicals, well, when the book was printed, how far back, and even back then, it was like 60 volumes, you know, literally hundreds of thousands, and every one of them gets an entry somewhere in this series of books by an author known as Bilstein. And they say Bilstein over and over and over again because somebody was looking at a volume of Bilstein. It was written in German, which is one good reason why a chemistry major or a chemical engineering major in a professional university um, going to Stanford or Princeton or whatever learning chemical engineering would also have been expected to learn German because then you could look stuff up in Bilstein for one thing. Because there's no equivalent in English, or at least there wasn't then. I don't know if there is now. So, but it's in, in German, and even if the year is out of date, um, we still have all these many, many uh, chemical compounds reported, each one reported in detail. All about it, its characteristics, its measurements, how to prepare it, you know, what reactions it can have with different things. And just, you know, and then that's one, and then there's another one, and another, and oh my goodness, literally hundreds of thousands of these different organic chemicals, all of them, exhausted. And that's then. Apparently there's a whole lot more that have been developed since then, which is probably why the original 60 volumes has come to have any number of supplementary volumes. It's a major a very central, you know, if you're doing organic chemistry, it's a very central reference book. 
but it's just too huge. You'd have to be very rich to afford to have one on your own shelf. But a serious university library where they do chemistry and teach chemistry and chemical engineering will, of course, have Bilstein on its shelves. It's well-known work. It's real. It's, it's not something made up for the story. So there's all of that that kind of teaches in the way. And so it all comes down to the question of how do we figure it out? Well, for once, I won't spoil that. Um, but I kind of look at it and, yeah, we should have known. Which one it was. The other people are all in the room were all kind of incidental. Um, there was some random guy looking up bug sprays or something. It was kind of this foreign guy. And there were five students, four of whom didn't even go by the reference desk where the librarian would be. They just went straight to the stack and they wouldn't even know who was there when. And the one, there was one, the fifth was kind of dating, had dated both girls. We, it's never clear the relationship, but uh, maybe there's a rivalry between the two girls which might provide a motive. But it still doesn't tell you which one, because either one of them could have that motive. They've both gone out with the guy. So. Anyway, that's Death of a Honey Blonde, and that's another Isaac Asimov story. And, uh, sorry, I can't tell you more about you know the original appearance of it. All I have is the one that's in the Asimov Mysteries. So, there it is. Thanks for listening.